isn't dead. There is coming a day when no heart it shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Brother Pip, as of an hour ago, yeah. 
uh, was still in the surgery. Um, folks, I, I, I prayed for him, and I thought, okay, it, it's not routine surgery, but it's, 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 it's serious enough. Um, but they're talking about how to reconstruct the intestine. The connection to that, so they stay put. So they stay put, yeah. So they have to figure out how they're going to keep the organs together. So everything flows the way it should, food and bowels and everything to how it should work. So he doesn't have to have a, a colostomy bag. Uh, so please, please, please. Um, you know what? Let's take a moment to pray for the dead. Heavenly Father, if he is still under the knife, Lord, uh, if, if the doctors are searching, Lord, these are, these are doctors, they're brilliant people. Uh, they have uh, the wit and wisdom for it. Uh, Lord, I'd ask that you would give them, if they're finding a hard time or things are becoming complicated, Lord, Brother Pip is in your hands. And, and Mrs. Pitt, and she, I'm sure she's worried. Lord, they're two solid people, uh, the Pips are. Lord, I ask that you would be with them, please. I know that you're with them, uh, but Lord, give it a, a good outcome, an expected outcome. Uh, Lord, not another burden, not another, not more baggage. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would uh, have a turnaround, right? Let the body come together the way that it should. Uh, Lord, we know that you see it. We know that you can help. Lord, I ask that you do that. Help Brother Pitt, Mrs. Pitt. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, anything else? Nothing else? Oh, the tractor recall. Track recall. Do you hoard tracks like a squirrel hoards nuts? Do you have them in your glove box, in your Bible, in your wallet, your middle console, or even <laughs> your junk drawer? Don't pretend that you don't have one. We have several. We have junk drawers, junk cabinets, right. junk rooms, junk. Well, I'll stay away from that. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's move along real quick here. Um, uh, let's see, I was going to say the trunk of your vehicle is full of junk. So, uh, I was going to, anyway, let's move along. So, we'll gather them up. Gather them up and bring them to the church. If you, uh, and I'm not saying don't have tracks. What we're saying is, is you've taken 50 before and you've only used 20, and then you forgot that you had 30 in your middle console, and then you took another 20 and you used five, and then 15 went to the extra 30, and then you forgot that you had them. And then you took someone and put them in your coat and forgot you had them. You took someone and put them in your car and your visor. You had them all over the place. We ought to call all of our ex-members too and say, hey, would you clean out your house and please bring all the tracks back to the church, please? Um, but uh, they're, they're out there. There's droves, droves, tons of them out there. So we are organizing all the remaining tracks uh, and placing them into bundles. So what we would like to do is take bundles of, of uh, 10 and 15, 20, whatever the case, but uh, a 10 and 15, and then you take a bundle or two at a time, and then you hand them out and you say, you know what, I, can, I know that I can get rid of 15. And you hand out 15. It's a whole lot better to come back and get more if you need it than it is to take some and forget that you have them. I already know we've been, we've been cleaning out our rooms in the house and uh, there's stacks of them on my room. So I have stacks of them here. Brought some to the church. Uh, Alex today brought some. He's like, hey, I got some tracks. I'm like, all right, cool. Just sit them there. We're going to collect them all and then uh, put them in the bundle so you can take some out of the time. Because what we want to do is, is we want to distribute everything that we have and then. Um, uh, Keep the yellow ones, of course, but update them. And uh, what we would also like to do is create new tracks. Uh, we were talking about it yesterday about um, uh, like a headline news type of track. You get people with headlines. Uh, brother, uh, uh, Pastor Jeff Fugate in Florida, he, he wrote a book and uh, he was, it just came to my mind as I was reading. He talked about the value of a soul. And I thought, oh man, that'd be a great track. You know, like um, how much does a soul cost? Or how much is a soul worth? Uh, and things that get people attention, and they, they look at it, oh, you know, uh, and then they read it. And I'm not talking about an accordion gospel track where it's, <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. You're like, holy cow, I might as well just get a Bible. Um, uh, that's a salvation track if they have time to read it. But we, what we want to do is we want to get the gospel in people's hands. That's what it's all about: is the gospel, getting the gospel in people's hands. And we would like to be able to utilize our, our track that. 
by putting three, four, five, six, seven, maybe even uh, uh, different types of tracks out there that maybe you like more than another one or you feel like you use better than another one. Um, it's uh, the gospel will save anybody, but how you present it may form, it may form, okay, like a, um, one fellow might like um, a different kind of weapon than another. He says, I just, it, 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 this one fits me better. So we may have a Romans road track that you, that fits you. We may have a John, a John's track that, you know, you say, hey, the book of John, that, that, that I can use that to get you to. We may have all kinds of different uh, tracks that you would like to utilize. We would like to make those available. So what we want to do is gather all that we have, disperse what we have, and then kind of start fresh with um, uh, new tracks and uh, uh, new programs and different things like that. So uh, help the church office and clean out your junk drawer by bringing your stash of tracks to church next week. If you have any other type of stashes, don't tell anyone about them. Uh, um, uh, so, um, and then Miss Sarah makes a funny little joke at the end. Other stashes you may or may not be in possession of can be discussed with pastor during counseling. So, uh, <laughs> hey, strongholds, amen. Pulling down the strongholds. Okay, uh, let's see. Not here, not here, and not here. We'll make sure these get delivered. Make sure I put them right here so I do not forget them. And then the other two folks are not here, but I can make sure those get delivered. Okay, Brother Kevin, let's have our second song. Turn your handle to number 296, 296, file on. We'll do that first and third verse because we're doing acapella here. Right. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go, where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow. Early where he leads me I would follow, follow on, walking in his footsteps till the ground. Beside my Savior would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has trod. Up to where they gather in the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow. chapter 1. Follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. To Revelation chapter 1. I like the book of Revelation. How many of you have ever read the book of Revelation before? You might have chapter 1 or chapter 22. You've read it before. Have you had the same reaction I did at the end? Hmm. <laughs> what was that all about that I just read? You know, I need to get some commentaries on understanding what I just read. Now, I, uh, you cannot go wrong by coming to the Lord in faith and reading the Word. Uh, you can go to the book of Ezekiel, you can go to the book of Daniel, you can go to the book of, uh, of uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all those major prophets and minor prophets, and then get into the book of Revelation and go, man, when it comes to prophecy, I, do I grasp that I'm a sinner? Absolutely. Do I grasp that sin must be paid for? Absolutely. Do I grasp the, 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 the fact that there's a God in heaven? I absolutely do. And we believe all these things. But when it comes to these things of prophecy, we all go, mm -hmm. sure, I believe it, but I don't even know exactly what I believe. Uh, sure, I, I get it. And when it starts talking about all these mysterious things in the book of Revelation, you don't, you don't have to feel bad. And you don't have to sit there and wander and go, oh, man, I must not be right with God because I don't understand all this. And, uh, folks, there have been people who've been saved for decades and they still don't even understand it all. And it's not for a lack of trying. It's because, here I go, I know I'm, I'm, I'm beating this thing again. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to God. Now, all of Revelation is not a secret. There are things in the Bible, kings of this world, and, um, 
uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, false prophets and the Antichrist and the beast and Satan himself and all these things that if you were to read the book of Revelation and just read it and try to see it in your mind's eye as John saw it on the island of Patmos when he was caught away in the spirit and wrote it down as he saw it. If you'll just read it like that and just say, I'm just going to read it for what it is. And if God wants to reveal truth to me, he'll reveal truth. But uh, the more you repeat something, the more familiar you become with it. And the more that you understand the Bible, and you, the Bible says to grow in, the, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the more that you do that, the more that you do that, the more of the Bible you understand. I believe that obedience to the commands of God are direct connection to growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You say, I, listen, I, I'm going to say this, I don't care what anybody says, I believe that getting saved, well, of course getting saved, getting baptized, being a part of a no local New Testament church, tithing, giving offerings, supporting missions, getting involved in a ministry are directly related to your growth in Christ. Not just how mature of a Christian you have become, but I believe obedience in the things that you know to do unlocks the door to the things that you don't really understand in the Bible. Uh, one pastor put it this way. He said, man, you can just skim over the Bible and pick golden nuggets off the surface. There are all kinds of golden nuggets of truth lying right there, laying right there on the surface of Scripture. He's like, but as you get older, what happens is, is you, your knowledge equips you with a shovel to dig deeper. The Bible says to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If the Bible says that we have to do to, to divide the word of truth rightly, would that not imply that there's a way to do it incorrectly? If, if God told us to do it correctly, that would then imply that if we don't do it correctly, we could be doing it incorrectly. Now, I would like to do it correctly. I would like to know the Bible correctly. I would like to decipher the Bible in, in the truths of prophecy and things like that correctly. I don't want to run off on some tangent or run off on some, 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 uh, 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 some theory that's out there in left field somewhere that people are grasping at some truth because they like it or it's so mysterious and they think it's cool. No, I don't want to be, I don't, I, I don't want to just grasp the truth and hang on to it because it's popular or because it sounds nice. I want to know the truth and I want the truth. Why? Because the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen. Now there are some things in this, in the next several weeks that I, I'm in no hurry to get through the book of Revelation. I'm not going to try to cram it all down your throat in one service. I think that would be impossible to do anyway. Um, uh, but um, what I want to do is I just want to read um, uh, verses 4 through 8. Uh, 1 through 3 is an introduction. And then I want to dig into and just kind of settle tonight in verses 1 through 8. And basically give you a preview of things to come. A preview of things to come. Let's read and then we'll pray. The Bible says, John to the seven churches. Here we go. Uh, uh, now this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, God gave unto, uh, uh, God gave to Jesus, and Jesus gave to John. That's what this is talking about. Uh, verse two says, uh, "Who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that He saw? Blessed is He that readeth." Are we reading this right now? We're reading it, right? Okay, following along. The Bible says, "Blessed is He that readeth." And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. amen. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega 
the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come. The Almighty Heavenly Father, help us as we go through this book. Lord, there are a lot of mysteries, a lot of uh, uh, secret things, a lot of uh, un un almost uncomprehendable things in this book that we may not be able to grasp. Uh, but Lord, help us to get down to the practical truths and to the truths that we can take away, that they may aid us in our daily living for you. Heavenly Father, help us and come with you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the book of Revelation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hear it. It had a surgery. It was a difficult procedure. Doc said it went very well. Good. You're putting in a kidney tube that the drain out. And he should be in the room in about an hour. So no classroom day. No classroom. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm glad for him. Yeah. Man, I'm so glad for him and Brother Lip. That makes me happy. Yeah. Uh, and moving forward. Yeah. You know, I hope moving forward that they that they cleared the road for years ahead and he doesn't have to have any more problems uh, in, in that in that uh, regard. So thank the Lord for an answer to prayer right then and there. The Lord, and here's the awesome thing, the Lord had, I mean, that coming through, and we just prayed not long ago, the Lord had already answered before we even began to speak. Isn't that cool? Nah, that's awesome. Now, the book of Revelation, it's, it's a pretty amazing book. Uh, I was laying in bed the other night reading it just in awe. Man! And, and I had a pretty um, uh, vivid imagination when I was a kid. Um, my toys came to life because my imagination came to life. Um, I was a sound effects major at the age of four. Um, World War One, World War Two. I had memorized, you know, the sounds of missiles and gunfire and planes and trains and automobiles, you know, and you know, Germans and Japanese screaming as the Americans and the Allied powers overtook them, you know. Uh, but uh, I was, uh, I was a, I had an imagination that was untamable when it came to folks. And imagine your imagination is a world of its own. Uh, and when I got into my mind's eye, you know, uh, and by the way, well, no, that the people are talking about your, your, your third eye, you'll be in touch with your third eye and you'll know what the government is all about. And you'll know that aliens are real. Then you'll know that people are weird, man, they're weird. But I feel sorry for them because it's not that just that they're weird. It's that they've been deceived and they've believed a lie. They believe these lies about, anybody heard the theory of reptilian people? Anybody hear that? Reptilian, yeah, reptilian people. They're just in disguise, they're called shapeshifters. People believe it. They think that's real. Uh, aliens, shapeshifters, um, all kinds of stuff out there. But the fact of the matter is it, it's not hard to convince people, especially my generation is what it seems to be, my generation and the ones after me, that there's supernatural stuff. They believe in supernatural stuff, but it's so misguided. They believe in, they believe in everything besides God. Yeah. Amen. They believe in everything besides like an all-knowing, all-being, all-present, all-powerful, all-loving, all-existing, all beginning, never ending God. They believe anything and every in everybody else besides God, and that's that's what blows my mind is that they believe all these lies. In the Book of Revelation, if you'll read it and you'll use your 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 imagination to be able to be John, you be John, and say, okay, if I was John, and I was an old man or an old lady for that matter, and I was exiled to the island of Patmos. And I knew what day, what church day was. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was in church, amen. He was in church in the spirit. And he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And man, this vision came to me. Jesus came to me. And this is what it looked like. And he came to me and he appeared to me and he told me to write everything down that I saw. So John is caught away. Uh, uh, he's caught away and Jesus tells him to write these things down. And if you read the book of Revelation and read it, like you were the one writing it down, like you're giving your testimony and writing it down, you, no way, this is incredible. I laughed at some of the things that I read, not in mockery, but in, 
here's the weird word for you. I was flabbergasted. <laughs> I, was, I was shocked at some of the things that I read. I said, what in the world am I reading? This is insane. Thank God I'm not going to be here for it. Man, thank goodness I'm not going to be here to go through this. Now, the book of Revelation contains um, all the elements. I thought to myself, man, this would be an incredible book. Oh, it is a book. I said, man, this would be an incredible movie. This would be an incredible show. If somebody took this and turned it, if they took what John wrote and turned just, if they just wrote it according to John, how John wrote it, and they put it into a script or they put it into, and I know yeah, they add all these little things and whatnot, but man, it's incredible. All the twists and turns and developments in its pages. It had me turning page after page after page. I was like, man, I've got to lose. One ten in the morning, I'm like, I need to go to sleep. And I was a chapter. I started in chapter one and I got to chapter 17. And I'm like, uh, five more chapters. I can soldier through. Let me put toothpicks in my eyes. You know what I'm saying? I want to finish this thing, you know? Uh, but I knew it. I was like, as soon as I start going, wait, what did I just read? I would be done. And uh, so I got to that point. I got done with chapter 16. I got to chapter 17. Got about eight verses in. And I was like, I don't remember one word I just read. I think I need to go to sleep. <laughs> so I went to sleep, but I picked it up the next day, and the book of Revelation is an incredible book. It's incredible. Um, and it's filled with action and suspense and mystery and wonder and fear and drama and horror and excitement and, 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 and puts you on the edge of your seat type of stuff. And, and it takes 22 full chapters for all the action to develop and to culminate. But John gives us a... Uh, Jesus, God gave Jesus, and Jesus gave John, and John gave us a snake, that's a snake, a sneak preview, a snake preview, amen, a sneak preview of things that are going to happen. So, uh, he gives us just a little bit of taste. So, in these verses, in these verses, verses 4 through 8, we have an introduction, or 1 through 8, really, you have an introduction into uh, material, into a substance that will um, continue. I don't know right now. I may take four weeks on Revelation and then go into something God laid on my heart and then take another two weeks in Revelation or however it goes, but I, I want to take some time to go through the book of Revelation. Um, uh, and it's going to take time to develop and it's going to take time to move through these, these verses, verse by verse and chapter by chapter of the book of Revelation. And I don't, I'm not going to stand up here right now and tell you that I have the answers for the woman that's on the dragon, that's drinking the blood of the martyrs, that has ten heads and ten crowns, and I'm not going to, even though the angel tells John, this is what that is. Um, but there are things like that in Revelation. You're just, some of you just out there went, what did he just say? Did he just say there's a woman riding a dragon? Is this Game of Thrones? He said, hey, there's a woman riding a dragon that has ten heads and seven crowns and drinking blood of martyrs? What? What? This, that's weird, dude. All right, it's symbolic. It's symbolic. So a lot of the things in the Scripture of the book of Revelation are symbolic. They have meaning behind them. But some of them are what they are. Uh, and there's some, like the two witnesses, I can't wait to get to. Um, other, and there's some really neat stuff in this book. And I hope that if you're not too familiar with it, I hope that as we go through it, you get excited about it. And, and uh, it, it does something for your heart. Now, with, with, with that in mind, I want to take a look a sneak preview of things to come, of things to come. Verses four and five, you get your prelude, your prelude to the book of Revelation. But um, now the book of Revelation is a letter. Did you know that? How many know the book of Revelation was a letter? It's a letter. Does anybody know who the letter was to? Anybody? Here's a hint. Well, yeah, us, us, obviously, but to the church. seven churches, there's seven churches. It's a letter to the seven churches. Now, I'll, I'll get into that. It, it's a letter, to the, it says it right there, to the letter, uh, uh, to the seven churches which are in Asia, which you have Asia, Asia Minor, which is what the, which is your southeastern type of region before we we're uh, chopped up to the, to, the, to the world that we know that is created by the modern day borders. This would have been uh, 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 Asia Minor. This letter was to be sent to seven specific churches uh, in Asia, these churches are mentioned um, uh, in verse 11. It says, um, uh, whereas it, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it, John, to, unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and Smyrna 
and Pergamos, and Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those are the seven churches. So those seven churches, uh, they deal with chapters two and three is where you'll find these. He says, unto the church of, and he addresses each church. Um, uh, but uh, for the time being, and we're, I'm not really going to focus on that yet, what we need to remember about these churches is this. Since this letter is to the churches, what did I say in Sunday school this morning? Um, not all of the Bible is to me, but all of the Bible is for me. Okay, so am I, does anybody attend one of these churches here? No, you don't. Those churches are, are gone. The, the earth is still there, but they're gone. Those churches are gone. They're, they're, they're remnants. They're rubble. They're, uh, the, the, those congregations are gone. So since all of the Bible is not to me, but all of the Bible is for me, how does this, this letter to the seven churches apply to me? Okay, remember what I said, that some things are symbolic. Some things are symbolic. First, what we have to realize is that these were real. Real, literal churches. They, if you will, this is the way that I like to do it. I like to say that there was a, a, a Crystal and an Alex and a Miss Hillary and a Mr. and Mrs. Pohazi and uh, the Van Zoons and the Pips and the Jacksons and the Jules. And there were a version of those people and a, and a, um, uh, a uh, what are those people's names? Aretha and Carrie. Uh, there's a, there was an angel. There was, a, there was all these people who were like you. Hey. Went to these churches. Yes, sir. There was an there, listen. There was a, an Arif who struggled with what is it? Insulin. Insulin. There was somebody who had back pain, just like you. There was somebody who was falling asleep during the preacher's sermon. There was somebody whose husband uh, uh, yelled at him before they left. There was somebody whose wife was was um, uh, a Roseanne Barr type of woman, and so he's like, "I gotta get out of the house and get to church. I gotta get away from that woman." And the woman said the same thing about her husband, and kids said the same thing about their parents, and they all came. To, they all were like, they were real people. So when we read about these things, they're just not some like. They, people, they were real people. Our brothers and sisters in Christ, born again Christians, just like you and I are. So they were real people, real congregations that existed during the time that John wrote this book. Jesus spoke to them, the churches through John, but he spoke to John about real people, real saints, and real sinners, amen. Real situations, real problems. I always say wherever there's a problem, there's a solution. So wherever there's a, prob prob uh, a problematic situation, there is a solution. Yes, sir. And that's the same that Jesus is writing to them. So number one, you got to realize that these were real churches, real people, real issues. The second thing that you got to remember is these churches are representative. They are not just real churches, but they are also symbolic, or they represent every Christian church that has ever existed. Some people say that we are in the dispensation. It's a time frame. That we are in the Laodicean age of, of the church. Which, if you'll read it, you'll see the Laodicea was a type of church and they had these things. They were a lukewarm church. They loved the Lord, but they didn't love him enough to like really come into it. Uh, uh, but um, each one of these church, uh, or every church contains some of the characteristics that mark these early churches found in uh, chapter one, verse 11. So while this letter is not addressed to Three Rivers Baptist Church, it is addressed to the same problems, the same saints, same sinners, same, uh, 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 same uh, problems, same solutions, same situations. So while, like I said, Revelation is not written to Three Rivers, it is written for Three Rivers. Amen. Right? But, it, it, I mean, doesn't that make sense? If, if um, uh, somebody has a health problem and they are, they, the doctor speaks to them about their problem, and you're like, man, I, I'm having that same problem, but I'm in the beginning stages of it. Let me, let me, let me see what the doctor said about that. Isn't that what it, WebMD is all about? <laughs> Isn't that what uh, MayoClinic.com is all about? What's it come from? Research. What's it come from? Data. Or some people say data. Uh, what, what does it come from? Where does it come from? It comes from people inputting knowledge. Yeah, so. All right, well, how can our church 
be taught the same lessons that these churches were taught. Data, data, whatever you want to say. Knowledge, input, wisdom. Hey! So, <laughs> Chime me nuts, man. Uh, I appreciate it. Oh, I, I do. Um, uh, what was I saying? Data, input, not. So the Bible, so these two. That even though the book of Revelation wasn't written to me and to three rivers, it, was, it was written for three rivers. Now, uh, the letter was sent to the seven churches, the Bible says, and this is the first use of the number seven in the book of Revelation. How many of y'all know the, the significance of the book of the number seven? Seven is, is um, what's it mean? It means perfect, it means complete, it means a, a, a type of fullness. So when the Bible mentions seven churches, it's referring to, I believe it's referring to the church in its fullness. It's church, God's church, the bride of Christ in its fullness, the fullness of the body of Christ. And if you'll read about the, the, the fullness of the body of Christ, it has its ups and downs. It has its flaws. And the Lord addresses each one of them. So uh, uh, this is why I say that um, this book is not uh, specifically written to us, but definitely written for us, and it speaks for us, even as if we were there. It's the same message for us. So seven is a prominent number. Even still in our world, there are, um, uh, what are there, seven colors on the light spectrum. There are seven notes in a musical uh, scale. There are seven days in one week. Well, we get that from the uh, Rome, you know, the Roman uh, period and we run on a Roman time. No, no, we don't. I mean, yeah, I, I get it. I understand. And I'll let everybody have their cake and they can eat it too. Uh, but I believe in a God who knows everything we're going through. And I believe in a God who um, is in and uh, about everything. And uh, I believe that seven is the number of completion. It says that God rested on the seventh day. Uh, so seven appears all kinds of times in the Bible. God commands, um, uh, commanded seven feasts in the law. There are seven secrets, or you could say mysteries, uh, in the uh, uh, Christ's parable of the kingdom. Uh, there were seven saints on the cross at Jericho. Uh, seven priests carrying seven trumpets marched around the city of Jericho for seven days. And on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. In the book of, uh, well, no, not in the book of Numbers, in the book of Revelation, the number is seven, used, I, I believe it's 49 times, which is seven times seven. You're like, Brother Jake, now you're just getting, you said you weren't going to do that. But I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just, these are just like in your face type of facts. 49 times the number seven is used, and if you do seven times seven, that's 49. So here's some of the sevens in the book of Revelation. Uh, in chapter one, you're going to find seven churches, seven spirits, seven stars. In chapter four, you're going to find seven seals. In chapter five, you're going to find seven horns. In chapter six, you're going to find seven eyes. In chapters, uh, seven, uh, chapter eight, you're going to find seven trumpets and seven angels. Chapter 10, you're going to find seven thunders. Chapter 12, you're going to find seven heads and seven crowns. Chapter 15, you're going to find seven plagues. Chapter 17, uh, or 15, seven plagues. Chapter 17, seven vials, seven, uh, uh, seven mountains, seven kings. And that's just not, that I missed some. I mean, you're going to find that just mixed up in there. But there are all kinds of other sevens in this book. And that's just a small sample of all kinds of ones that you're going to see. Now, there are um, uh, uh, all kinds of mysteries of the book of Revelation. And the Bible says it right here. He says, blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. Isn't that what we did tonight? Yeah. I mean, there's a simple blessing right there. Y'all want blessed? Yeah, sure. Let the preacher read it and you hear it. Or okay. you go home and you read it and let your people, and let your, your clique, your family, your posse, your gang listen to it. Let your family listen. He that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, it was written to the seven churches, but there was a uh, there was uh, some desire behind it. There was a mission behind it. Uh, and, uh, there was a purpose to the letter. And what does it say? It says grace. What did I say this morning? Grace unto you and peace. Wait a second. Do you know what you're getting ready to get into in the book of Revelation? And it says grace unto you and peace. 
The last I checked, I won't need any of that because I won't be here. Grace and peace, I know what? I, I have received grace and I am overwhelmed with peace because I won't be here to go through what a whole lot of people are going to go through in this book. Now, this is the, the classic New Testament dedication. Uh, Paul did it, Peter did it, but uh, and John does it. Grace and peace. John greets them with a prayer that they will continue to enjoy uh, these churches, the all-sufficient grace of God uh, and the peace of God, which we say passes all understanding. Now, while the book of Revelation is, um, uh, uh, it's, it's a difficult book and it's filled with, with, with different scenes and the scenes of judgment and scenes of condemnation, it is a book of joy for some people. It is a book of joy for some people. Well, how is that? Well, I think because it reveals God's grace. It reveals God's grace in the lives of his people. And it's a, it's a, it's a point of Jesus coming back to the world a second time where grace and peace will reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I think this is a great way to introduce the book. It's a great way to say, hey, y'all, y'all want to read the scariest book that you've ever read? Oh, uh, not really. Well, too bad, because here's the truth of it. This is how it starts. It starts with grace and peace, if you are able to claim that. Well, how do we claim that? Well, you got to know the one that's coming back again. If you get to know Jesus, it's grace and peace. If you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, it's hell on earth. Literally. Literal hell on earth. I'm telling you folks, my dad wanted to dig into it, but he didn't really know how to, um, he was just blown away by a lot of the facts. And, and he was trying to get to a driving point and um, uh, he didn't want to start to handle it. But the book begins to unfold and one third of all the seas turn to blood. One third of everything in the seas die. One third of mankind dies. One third of all the trees on the earth burn up. One third of all the stars in our universe fall. One third of the moon is turned to blood. One third of the sun is darkened. Just like that. One third of the earth. Where are we going to bury all those people? The Bible says at one point that it all turns to blood and no man, no man, you won't have fresh water. You won't be able to bathe. You won't be able to, the, 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 um, uh, the, the everything from, from food and, and famine and uh, uh, death and pestilence. The Bible says that hailstones will fall out of the skies and crush men. It says that there will be locusts who will sting like scorpions and that men will wish to die and can't. Fire. We think, oh, well, climate change. Yeah, you wait till God gets a hold of this place. You wait till the Holy Spirit of God is taken up out of this place. And there's not, well, there's not one Christian left to preach on the streets. There will come a day where people will wish they could go to church. There will, can you imagine that? Where people wake up and go, man, I wish there was a church service somewhere today. Man, I wish there was somebody on earth who could tell us what was going on today. Then some people will be left and say, ah, there was a church service I went to. Over there, that, that church that everybody overlooked on 1406 in Lombard. We all thought they were crazy for a while. I guess they were right. And it's not, we're not going to go in heaven and go, ha ha, we were right. It'll be more like, y'all should have listened. Y'all should have listened. But, but uh, uh, the, 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 that letter, man, it gets dark, it gets scary, but not for you and not for me. It's grace and peace because I won't be there for it. I won't be there. But the great promise of grace and peace comes to us from, some people diss on the Trinity, but it, some people deny the Trinity. I just want to smack them in the Holy Spirit in it. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We get peace from God, from our Savior, and from the Spirit that dwells inside of us. The Bible says, notice that word in verse number four and five. It says from, from, from. That means it went from somewhere to somewhere. From, from God. The word's used three times, and each time it appears, it introduces another member of the Godhead. You can't find the word Trinity. 
And you can't find the name or the, 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 uh, the, the phrase or anything that has to do with the Trinity. Uh, you're right, the word Trinity isn't in there. But God the Father's there, and God the Son's there, and God the Holy Spirit's right there from God, from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, so God is the source of all of grace and all of peace. These two verses, verses 4 and 5. Uh, if you'll read them and you'll, you'll, you'll mull over them, they'll remind you that this book was not a creation of man. This book didn't come from man. John didn't, John didn't eat some, uh, smoke some peyote. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't eat some shrooms. He wasn't on a trip. He wasn't tripping LSD. He wasn't doing that. God used him. God, God used that man to write down things to come. Things to come. These are the words of God to man. Now, people, they're joking away. Well, the Bible was written by man. You mean like every transcript at NASA? You mean like every history book and every science book and every biology book and every, you mean like that? You mean like that? Well, I'm not gonna believe what man has to say while you read your headline news. You believe CNN, but you won't believe God. You believe Fox News, but you won't believe God. You believe MSNBC, but you won't believe God. You believe all these things, but you won't believe in an ancient book that is all powerful. And the Bible says, we have seen and do testify. Go ahead, go down to the Allen County Superior Court and start pulling out records of people's written and, and verbal testimony. And go ahead and throw it out because it's no good. Whoa, whoa, we can we take that for why a man said it. A person said it. If you want to discount man, well then you gotta throw every piece of literature away. If you didn't see it, well, I went to Indianapolis for work some uh, a couple years ago, and that man was with me, and um, we started talking about the Lord and about God, and he said, Well, I don't even really believe there was a God. And um, no, no, no. How did the conversation go? Let me think. Uh Oh, come on, Jackson. We started talking about the Lord. Oh, and then about the existence of God. And I said, well, how do you know George Washington exists? Well, there's pictures. I said, there are pictures of George Washington? You have a, you know where pictures are of George Washington? Those have had to be worth millions. I mean, millions of dollars. I hope of you, I hope those of you who understand what's being said right now. You didn't have, nobody has a picture, a click picture. Right. George Washington, you have a rendering, maybe a painting, mm -hmm. but you do not have a picture of George Washington. And I told him, I said, no, you don't, you don't have a picture of George Washington. I said, so how do you know he really existed? And he just kind of, well, there's evidence, there are documents. I said, yeah, but were you there? Did you see it, did you? Well, no. And I said, so, but you believe it though, right? He's about a 63 year old man. And I said, uh, but you believe it, right? And he just kind of shook his head. He went, yeah. I was like, so why didn't you believe that what he said? I have seen and uh, we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the, 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 the Savior of the world. These men and these women are giving their testimony and it's being recorded. And what we throw it out because we didn't see it, because we didn't hear it, because we weren't there. You're a fool. You're a fool if you don't believe. And a lot of people, they don't believe it. They turn away from it. And to this book, this book is condemnation to them. This book is, y'all know who Cleo is, the fortune teller Cleo? I mean, she's old, that's the passing of, but a, a medium or a fortune teller, and she wants to see the palm of your hand. I, I don't need the palm of your hand, but I will ask you, are you a born again Christian? No, I'm not, I'm a God hating, God denying heathen. All right, well then I can tell you your future. Here's your future. And you say, well, I am a born again Christian. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I try to serve my, I try to do what's right. Guess what? I can also tell your future. I can also tell your future. It's been written. It's been settled. It's done. It's signed. It's sealed. And it's on its way to being delivered. So let's get into it very quickly. These two verses remind us that this book is not created by men, but it's written. And these are the words of God to men. And since it is words God's to men, it carries with it incredible power, great responsibility, and uh, a divine authority. 
So let's look at look, let's look at it. Number one, we have a father, we have our father. Our father, our father. It identifies God. This is what the book of Revelation does. It identifies God who is the self-existent one. People say, where'd God come from? Well, I don't know, but when you figure it out, please let me know. And what they want to do is they want to diss you. They want to try to break down what it is that you believe. I just throw it right back in their face. People usually are set back on their heels when the person that they are combating claims vulnerability. Oh yeah, where'd God come from? Beats me, man. I'm glad I know him. I've had people, I've done that before, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah about God. And I said, no, God does. God, God, God does exist. I know him personally. People are like, oh, you're nuts. No, I'm not nuts. I'm privileged though that I know God Almighty. You can say, hey, you know God. I talked to a Catholic fellow on the phone for quite some time, and I told him he, if he was a born again Christian, he had the right to go to God and pray to God on his own behalf. He didn't have to go to some guy downtown and call him father right. and go into some confessional booth and tell him his sins. I told that guy on the phone, I said, you know that Catholic priest is just as guilty as you are? I said, you know he's just as much of a sinner as you are? He's probably on his way, way to hell just like you are. And the guy couldn't, he, he couldn't, and this was, it started off as a professional business call. And it got into dying and going to hell. I guess when you're looking to give the gospel out, <laughs> conversations go all kinds of ways. And he said, you know, I try to be good, I try to do all these things, da, 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 da. And I said, listen, man, if you just believe on Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, not by the works of righteousness, which you have done, but according to his mercy, he saved you. Not by any type of works, not by any type of went to church. And I gave him a whole rundown, you know, and he's like, and he told me on the phone, he said, I've never heard these things before. I've never heard this before. I said, you never heard it before. I said, but you're hearing it now. Amen. I said, and if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God's only Son, who loved you and died for you, shed his blood for you, rose for you, coming back again for you, I said, you can be in God's family. All you have to do is ask, and then you no longer have to make your way downtown and meet some dude in a special collar and, and go in some place and tell him everything you did bad that week. So you go to God Almighty. I said, it's called the priesthood of the believer. And he said, I've never heard that. I said, well, I'm not making it up. I said, we are a Bible-based church. So I told him, I said, the Pope is not in charge of our church. I said, there's not some, there's not a board somewhere in, in charge of our church. I said, you know what's in, you know who's in charge of our church? And he's like, no. I said, me. No, I said, no. I said, no. <laughs> no. I didn't say that at all. I said, uh, I said, the Bible's in charge of our church. Did you, I said the Bible, and I, I asked him, I said, do you know who's in charge of our country? And this, he was an older, he's old enough to be my father. He said, well, the president. I said, no, it's not. Hmm. I said, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, the, the founding documents, those, those were what's in charge of our country. Because all these yahoos that we call leadership in our country want to bounce us all over the place. But bless God, thank goodness for those documents that they bounce around in those parameters and they try to break through, Amen. But thank goodness for those documents. Thank goodness for the Bill of Rights. Thank goodness for the Declaration of Independence. Thank, thank, thank God for those things. Um, uh, but um, uh, our Constitution, I said, that's what's in charge. And he's like, oh, man, that's good. I said, well, the Bible is in charge. We have a living document. It's called the Word of God. And he was just, wow, man. I don't... The Word of God. And if you believe these things, you do one, you fall in one of two things. Grace and peace, or you fall into fear. You fall into fear. Why? Because we have a sovereign father, the self-existent one, the God who called himself in Exodus chapter 3, the I am. He said, Moses, you go tell him the, uh, the I am sent you. The God who always has existed in the source of grace and in the source of peace, he always has existed. Aww. Now, God is the eternal one, uh, 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 and, and he lives in, 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 in three dimensions. <gasps> three dimensions. Yeah, past, the present, and future. By his Holy Spirit. God lives in all three of them. God's in it and through it and all. If God is restricted by our clock and by the sun and the moon and the seasons, then he isn't God. Right? Right. If my God is, is, is like uh, like a uh, uh, was it Elijah? Yeah, but like Elijah said to the to the pagans, he said, Oh, your God's on vacation. Go ahead and call him God. Hey, you, you worshipers of Baal, go ahead and beat yourself. Go ahead and cut yourself. You go ahead and sacrifice to your God. He must be taking a nap. 
He must be on vacation. He goes on a long journey. Elijah was over there, or Elijah's over there talking smack to these pagans, these pagan, these heathens. And they're over there weeping and cutting themselves, going, Oh, uh, Baal, hear us. Elijah's over there, like, taking the last puff on his marble, you know. <laughs> Come on, man. You're like, oh, don't say that, Elijah. Elijah's going to strike me down. No, he's not. He's a human just like I was, amen. Uh, but a prophet used of God. And Elijah said, okay, y'all done? Y'all done? All right, it's my turn. And then Elijah did a great work with a big sacrifice. And, and then he soaked it in water and he could drug, dug a trench around it, filled it with water. Hey, folks, you can't burn. You can't have a burnt offering if it's soaking in water, can you? No. But Elijah stood there and said, oh, my God, I'm calling down fire. Heaven. And fire came pouring down from heaven, and then the Bible says that the fire of heaven came down and licked up all the stones and all the wood and the whole sacrifice and all the wire. And there wasn't a drop left. The ground was scorched, and all these fools over here worshiped the Baal, fell down on their faces and said, Oh my goodness, this is Elijah's God is God. 400 of them fools looking for God. And folks, I serve the God of Elijah. I serve the God of Elisha. The same Elisha. I love it. The same thing that, that uh, 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 Elisha followed after Elijah. And Elijah was called up to heaven by God in a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. And Elijah said to Elisha, hey, man, before I get out of here, tell me one thing that I can give you. And Elisha said, I want a double portion of what you got. And Elijah was like, oh, my goodness gracious. Do you know what you just asked for? And Elijah was like, I want it. And Elijah, and, and, uh, Elijah said, well, I want it anyway. And Elijah was like, all right, if you see me, when I send up in the head of my Lord, you'll have it. You'll have it. And when, man, when Elijah was taken out, it says his cloak was taken with him. Boom, and it says that Elijah got it. And he came to the river Jordan, amen. And he said, oh, he took that cloak. Man, I love this. And he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Boom, and he smoked that water, and he says that the water's part. I'm like, all right, where's the suit coat of Jack Hiles? Let me get that. Where's the suit coat of Doug Jackson and Lester Roloff and Lee Robertson and Tom Alone and Carl Hatch and um, my Curtis Hudson? Give me one. Can I have one of what they got? And I said, man, bless God. Oh, where's the Lord God of Elijah? Folks, you can do that today. You can walk around and say, hey, where's the Lord God of Gideon? Where's the Lord God of Moses? Where's the Lord God? Because he's the same God today. And here's the cool thing. Mom, we haven't even reached this point yet. And he's the same God. Amen. He hasn't changed. He's just telling us what's coming. So I like walking around going, man, I serve the I am. I serve the I am. The I am sent me out so many. Get that. The I am sent me to preach. The I am sent me to teach. The I am sent me to love my wife. The I am sent me to raise my kids. The I am sent me to be patriotic in my country. The I am sent me to be an ambassador oh. of heaven. So the sovereign father of this book is the same book that was at the beginning of the book, is the same God now, and is the same God as we read through this Bible. He's not changed. He's not a different God. He's the eternal one. He's the one who lives in the past, the present, and the future, all at the same time. And if God was limited to these parameters, then he's not God, and he's not worth serving. Oh, now, he exists. God exists. And he's always going to exist. And this is the God who is the source of grace and the source of peace. This is the God who never changes. Says it in Malachi, says it in Hebrew, says it in James. He is our source. He is our source. So he is the sovereign father, but he also has the sufficient spirit. And I'll stop with this. Well, I'll stop with the son. But the spirit, the phrase, the seven spirits which are before his throne, the seven spirits, and I had to look at them, the seven spirits, of, man, I had to go back to Isaiah and look at Isaiah and go, okay, these are the seven spirits of God that say these are the seven spirits, but in this context, it's a big S. Man, what does that mean? Does that mean God's bipolar? Oh, wait, oh, what does that mean? You know, so you start looking and you start searching and you start, okay, the seven spirits, which are before his throne, speaks of, I believe you could say his fullness, his perfection, his completeness, completeness, the seven spirits of God, his, his uh, uh, emotions or the spirits of God. It refers to, you could say, the ministry, in, in his ministry, 
in our lives, saints' lives. He's able to give us grace. He's able to give us peace because he is perfect and because he is complete. Folks, he is all we need as we go through this life. I try to tell that to somebody uh, uh, today. He's all you need. Amen. He is all you need. I told somebody, uh, I said, listen, I don't mean to make it like I'm sounding or like I'm blaming God in any way. I was like, but when I come to a place of crossroads in my faith and I just have to proceed forward, like Pastor Jackson said last week, about uh, just keep going forward, move forward, go forward. Um, uh, uh, and I come to a crossroads in life and I have decisions to make and I feel like God is being silent and that God's maybe, it's not that he's not listening, but he's definitely being silent and, and I can't get an answer and I've been praying for a long time. It seems like I don't have any direction. I begin to live my life, this is what I told him, I begin to live my life doing what I know to do and then I, I, I put all the responsibility on God. God, however this turns out, it's either to your glory or, or to your fault. <sighs> Did you just say it was God's fault? Yep. How can you do that? Because I'm a human. Because I'm still growing in grace. And did you know that I think God, he's pretty grown up enough to know what I mean, to know what you mean. When I say, dear God, I'm living by faith and it's falling apart. I'm living by faith and I've got nothing to show. I'm living by faith and I, 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 I don't know what to do, Lord. I'm, I'm losing it. I believe First Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care upon him for a reason. Because when I'm frustrated in my faith and it doesn't seem to be coming to fruition and giving me fullness or bearing fruit, I don't usually come to the Lord and go, here you go, Lord, here are my problems. This is what I do. And forgive me for making any type of mess. I'll have my kids clean it up after church. <laughs> okay, good. You know what I do? This is what I do. I don't come up to the Lord and I go, dear Lord, here, here are my problems. And this is it didn't say to lay them at his feet. It said, cast them. Wow. Hey God! You should go check out cookie. Okay, I'll have Mr. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, how, how could you? Folks, I have walked in here and paced back and forth before and went, hey God, you're the one that called me to the ministry, not me. Hey God, what are you going to like, I don't know, open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing. You're like, mm, Brother Jen, you would never talk to the Lord that way. Mm, how much would it be? Everybody starts moving in the back. Is that like me? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you get everybody gets scared. You say, how can you talk to the Lord that way? Because I'm a human. Because I'm frustrated, because I don't always get the big picture. Because sometimes the fact, the faith of my, the foundation of my faith is shaken. Yes, it's built on a rock, but I still have problems. Yes, it's built on a rock, but I still fear. It's not about not having fear. It's about being able to conquer it. It's not about um, I'm never doubting. It's being able to have confidence. I know who I believe, and I'm persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. And I go to God and say, Hey, God. You gave these kids to me. He said, no. no. I, I, I gave these kids. God, you gave me these kids. God, you gave me this wife. God, you gave me this life. God, you called me to the ministry. God, you had me venture out in business. God, you called me to do all these things. And yet, where is the supply? Where is the supply, God? Where is the windows of heaven open up? Not only do I not feel that the windows of heaven are open up, I think you've sealed up the windows of heaven and you shut all the doors and bless God there's a famine. Oh, and God says, oh, oh, there's a famine in the land? How about you open up my book and read about my prophets and my children and my people who did great things in the midst of a famine? <sighs> okay, God. <laughs> you win. And then I, I bent. And then I come back to God and I go, hey God, it's me. Can I come in? And God says, yeah, come on. And I open up the door, you know. Um, about earlier. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big dummy, Lord. I'm sorry. But Lord, you got to, Lord, I know you understand. And 
Lord, sometimes I just, I, I don't know what other words to say. I don't know what else to do. You want me to be your child? I came to be your child through Jesus Christ. I follow the Lord in believers' baptism. I started supporting missions. I started tithing. I got involved in a ministry. I started giving my talents and my time and my treasure to the ministry for the cause of Christ. And, and it seems that things kind of got worse. How is that supposed to happen? Well, it's called temptation and it's called trial. You know how I regained that peace, though? By casting my, and he didn't say I came in through it at him. I did not take my stuff and go, hey, God! And I went, hey! Here's my problems! Not in some sort of malicious, stupid, foolish way. But I come up to God, and I, I take my stuff and I say, hey, God! Here's your pastorate. What in the world are we doing? Hey, God, here's how you bless me to be a father. God, I don't even understand this thing. I don't even know what you've called me to do. Here I am trying to be and do it. And, I, and you're not telling me. You're not giving me any instructions. I give you your word every single day. And I'll go, God, help me to be a father. And help me to be a husband. Help me to be a pastor. Help me to be a good citizen. Help me to be a good friend. Help me to do all that I'm supposed to be. And you don't even talk to me through your word. I'm reading Leviticus. How am I supposed to get something out of that? So you turn on YouTube and you get old CDs and old cassette tapes and you go through old manuscripts and you try to read and you're searching, you're fighting and you're looking and you're like, God, you said if, you, if I ask, you'll answer. If I knock, you'll open. If I seek, I'll hug, but I haven't been finding, I haven't been seeing, and a door doesn't feel like it's been opened. Where is the sovereign God? Where is the sincere spirit? Where is the simple son, the loving son? Where am I? I don't feel you. I don't think that you're there. I can't feel that you're there. But Job said, this is where confidence in the Bible comes in. And this is where you can really say that the Bible is your final authority. Job said, I look in front of me. No God. I look behind me. No God. No God. I look to the left. Stand up, preach. No God. <laughs> Here, I look to the right. No God. No God. But you know what Job said? Job said, but I know when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. This is where the mindset of of my mindset comes in. Don't quit. 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 Preach it. Don't quit. I mean, you have your brain, it's like your brain and your spirit break in the right way. And you go, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I just know I'm not quitting. Amen. Hey. Death may come, I, I'm not quitting. Financial ruin may come, I'm not quitting. Health, uh, bad health may come, I'm not quitting. Uh, uh, everyone may turn against me, I'm not quitting. I just, I, I can't quit, because he's gonna quit. I'm holding out till God gives in, like Jacob wrestling with an angel. And he said, I'm not letting you go, Jacob. Wrestling with an angel, he, and the angel was like, let me go, I gotta, I, the day is coming up, I gotta go to heaven. I gotta go back up. And he's like, no, nope, you're not going until you bless me. And sometimes you just gotta grab a hold of the horns of the altar. You just gotta come up and grab a hold of the throne of grace. You gotta get, grab a hold of that Bible, get in your prayer closet, and get a hold of God and say, hey, dear God, everybody else can shut it for a while. You're gonna have to stop listening to everybody else for a while and pay attention to me because I'm not letting go until you bless me. You're like, how do I know though? I don't know, it's just this like, like your kids ask you, when are we going? When are we going? When are we going? When can I have? When can I have? When can I have? And you're like, yeah! You do one of two things. You say, shut up, kid! Or you say, fine, here, take it, go away. <laughs> go away! But the parable in the Bible says that that old little water woman, well, widow woman, came to the king, an unjust king. An unjust king, and said, oh king, oh king, oh king, oh king, oh king. And what did the Bible say? The Bible says that the king answered her. He gave her her petitions because she wouldn't stop bothering him. And Jesus said, how much more do you think I feel toward you? You're my child. 
You fathers want to feed your children. You, your child asks for fish. Will you give them a serpent? Your, father, your child asks for bread. Will you give them a stone? He says, ye then being evil, and not sinister evil, haha, but like sinners, evil-minded, evil people. He said, you being imperfect people want to give good things to your children. How much do you think I want to give good things to you, God says? Right. So if he says that in his word, I got to go, okay, how do I get into that? How do I do that? You're like, Brother Jake, where is Revelation in all of this? I was hoping to get preaching. I was hoping that this would happen. I was hoping, I didn't want Sunday just to be, want, 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 Charlie Brown, want, 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 Revelation, want, 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 want Revelation. Bless God, we only got a little bit of time on this earth, and I don't want to waste it being want, 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 want. I want some preaching. I want some truth. I want some stuff that's going to help me, and I want to be able to help you. And the book of Revelation, it tells us about a sovereign father. It tells us about a sufficient spirit, a, a spirit that is there always, that is always there, and we don't have to fall, and we don't have to fail. And bless God, it talks about a splendid son, yeah. splendid son. John says there's a third source for grace and peace, not just the Father, not just the Spirit, but, uh, but also the Son. He tells them that these things were to come from Jesus Christ. I have grace and I have peace from Jesus. So when John has mentioned that the Father and the Spirit, he spoke of them in a symbolic language. He said that when he speaks of Jesus, he uses straightforward language. And Jesus sets on center stage, amen? Jesus is at the center. Why? What's the purpose of, th of that? Because the purpose of this book is to reveal or unveil Jesus. Je Revelation means to reveal. Reveal what? The end times? Yeah, but what about the end times? Jesus is coming back to be the king. Amen. Are you living a life that's honorable to the king? Are you living a life? Uh, Alice? Go ahead and, and, and uh, shut this down, the Facebook thing, and then Miss Jennifer's not here tonight. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm just going to have you come forward while I close, and then have you start getting ready for the baptism. All right? Go ahead and do what you have to do. But are you living a